Welcome to the Rusted Garden Homestead. In today's episode of Friday Morning Ramblings, we're going to tour the whole garden. I'm going to show you um, all the mature vegetables that are in there. This is really the time that I'm just taking tons of stuff out of the garden. These are muscadines. I have two vines planted, one right there and then one over there. You really only needed one plant. I didn't know what I was doing when I first started, so I kind of overplanted, uh, overplanted the muscadines. They're like grapes. Here's how I prune them. I just cut some shears, hacked away the bottom. There is a better way to prune. One day I will learn how to do that. They are starting to produce fruit. Again, they're like grapes. They're uh, delicious actually, and they're very hardy. They grow better than grapes here in Maryland Zone 7 in my opinion, or at least there seem to be less problems. The damage that's on there now are really from Japanese beetles. Blueberries, still coming, been harvesting. Blackberries doing really well. Strawberries, the uh, everbearing are still producing. And the alpine strawberries are producing too, which I don't really like, but they're sort of growing on me in the sense that they are producing now in July. So problems in the garden. So here's a pepper um, area. I have 12, 14 pepper plants in there. Did a video on it. I just cleaned this up. The plants fell over. There were lots of bottom leaves. The muscadines were growing over them. I really didn't have the sunshine going into the bottom like I needed. And they were suffering. There are outbreaks of different um, fungus on here. I've sprayed this already with hydrogen peroxide. I put down baking soda. Uh, started a video from this point on and I'm gonna wait two weeks to show how these come back. I'm doing the video a little bit backwards. Anyway, you definitely want to have open space so that the light is getting in there. That really reduces different kind of uh, fungal problems in the soil, maybe on the leaves. Sunshine is the great antiseptic. However, these are being treated just like my tomato plants with the hydrogen peroxide spray, which I will link in the video description. The peppers look good though. I've been harvesting several large peppers off there. These are going to be different colors. And I just want to show you the pattern. Like that's a fungus on there. And it's always when you have concentric rings, brown rings within brown rings within brown rings. This is more active when it has, let's see if we can get in there, the yellow halo around there. But again, this was sprayed, they should be okay. But different peppers are coming in, still producing, beat up, but still producing. Over here, my shishitos. Um, I'm now on, well, I've been on Instagram. I'm doing lots of Instagram reels and just doing one minute highlights of different garden topics. I just did one on the shishito peppers. If you are, uh, are on Instagram look up the rusted garden just look how beautiful these peppers are two to three inches sweet pepper sometimes one might be hot I don't know why it's just kind of random but I grill these all the time this is like wave two starting wave three of the peppers but the plants are really really prolific I had lettuce in here that I, I don't know why I just letting it grow and seed but it started blocking the airflow in the sunlight and I was getting disease on the leaves right there where the lettuce was. So I cleared everything out, removed some of the bottom leaves, and again, letting that airflow go through there, letting the sun shine in, these all got sprayed too. This is what happens when you don't need a section of your garden. Haven't been using anything in there really. Those plants, believe it or not, um, I can get in those herbs, I will tuck them in somewhere, and I could probably save those eggplant if I had space. Um, but at some point, I have to let them go. Haven't gotten in here for the, uh, using the weed eater. This is kind of where I stopped, but I will get in here, cut everything back. I'm just using a weed eater now. I just don't feel like weeding by hand in July. Everything in here looks really good. I've been pulling out some of the weeds and I just drop them, you know, wherever I'm pulling them from. Ginger, those are artichokes right there. The fruit plants, the one on the left here is struggling a little bit. More yellow, the peppers are yellow. I need to increase the fertilizer in there. The plum plant over there looks pretty good and it looks a little bit bigger than a dwarf. I'm a little concerned. However, I like the area. Whenever you're putting in lots of new soil and you're really filling up a metal bed or really large containers or raised beds or whatever, sometimes the balance of fertilizer isn't right. So definitely I'm going to be giving the peppers here some water soluble fertilizer. You can see even though the fruit tree over here is doing okay, the peppers in there are struggling. So, you know, that soil, anytime that you're setting up those kind of large raised beds, even something like that over there, 
Second year is going to be better because stuff will be broken down. The microbiology, soil life will be all over the place. Remember the eggplant that were struggling? Look how nice they're doing now. They're nice and green. They've been getting dusted as needed to control the uh, flea beetle. There's one right there, two right there. So it's time to dust them again tonight. Let's see if we can get close. Anyway, they're little black specks that hop around. They will chew so many holes in here that it's just crazy. Dust. Every seven to ten days, I dust in the evening. I've talked about that. Take it off in the morning. Reduce harm to the good insects. But it's really looking nice. This will be producing in about two weeks. So it'll be four beautiful eggplant right in there. Tomatoes are starting to produce you can see how they're looking. We'll go over where I had that fungal problem I think I talked about um, maybe in the last ramblings. The peppers in here are doing well. These are the jalapenos. Fungal issues. The weather here has just been crazy. So while my peppers last year really weren't bothered by stuff, I'm having to keep an eye on them and spray them with the hydrogen peroxide. Um, putting down, this is baking soda and some other stuff. I don't want to talk about that yet because I'm still kind of working on a mix. I'll talk about it more when I know how well it works. But look at all the jalapenos. I mean, they're everywhere. There's one they eat. I mean, there's hundreds in there. And I took a lot of the bottom leaves off, really let that airflow go through there. The uh, Green beans are doing well, even though they're purple, they're still green beans. They're starting to produce. I'll be eating these this weekend. Let's spin around inside here. And you can just see the burgundy beans are just beautiful. It's a beautiful color. They taste just like green beans. You grow them just like green pole beans. Some disease is starting down on the bottom. I've sprayed this with hydrogen peroxide at a 8 ounces to a gallon. I'm actually going to test out, and am, I should say, I am testing out 8 ounces on every plant in my garden just to see how it goes. And so far they seem to be doing okay. Diseases come. You know, I use peppermint oil on my beans. I did a video on that on my cucumbers. But problems still show up. These are going to produce a ton. By the time the problem that is down here if I don't get it under control or it works its way up the plant, I'm going to have so much production out of here, you know, I'm good to go. And I also plant a pole beans from seed in another area. Sunflowers are looking great in here. This is just what happens to my sunflowers. I haven't found a proper um, fungicide or spray that really helps with the sunflowers. Still working on that. Here's round, I don't know if this is two or three of my cucumbers, looking brilliant. Nice and green. Some yellow ing on the leaves. I don't know if you can see that pattern. Not sure why that's happening this year. You know, I might give them a little bit of a water soluble fertilizer, but they're growing well enough that I'm going to get, you know, cucumbers off of there. Here are my cantaloupe growing up my um, deck siding or deck railing um, trellis that I built. So looking at all these, that's what you like to see. You know, a nice pollinator in there doing its thing. However, when you look at these plants, I don't have one cantaloupe on here to size, unlike the melons. There's one right there, one right up there, and if you have a good eye, you can see one tucked back there. So I was just looking in this this morning. These are all male flowers. Anytime cucumber, squash, whatever, when it's just a stem, like where my thumb is, and a flower, that's a male flower. I had to look around finally found a female flower and you can see there's a little cantaloupe there. This is going to be true for cucumbers. There'll be a little cucumber or squash, a little squash. If this doesn't get pollinated, which it should because there's about a billion male, male flowers here, this will start to grow then it's going to brown tip and die off. And that's why you see sometimes your squash or your cucumbers not forming well. It's because they didn't get pollinated. Let's just get a close up of this guy. This is what you want to see. And I know people are concerned. I talk about insect dust. So you're going to notice I have pollinators everywhere. Using insect dust, chemical type, organic type, whatever, in a kind of um, cautious manner, respectful manner, you will be able to take care of pests and you're going to lower the impact on beneficial insects. You don't basically throw the dust everywhere here and kill everything. Just put the dust on the outer leaves. 
and you're going to have plenty of pollinators. Here's another cucumber plant that I'm growing in here. Not cucumber, cantaloupe plant that I'm growing in here. Can't find the female cantaloupe flowers on here either, so we'll see what happens. Here's a close-up of the other watermelon. So that's doing well. These don't get that heavy, so I'm not going to have to kind of create a hammock for support on there, but you could if you're growing heavier, heavier watermelon. Melon that I planted by seed. You still have time to plant bush watermelons um, by seed here in Maryland Zone 7. The apples are looking pretty good. There's a bunch in there. Some other ones forming over there. Coming down here, this is definitely my third wave of cucumbers. They were planted by seed. And they're, you know, they're looking good. If you like these metal raised beds, I'm affiliated with Vijega. You can find that in my video description. There's all kinds of different shapes and designs, and I really like them. I mean, they've added to my garden for sure. Pepper plants that I put in late, a little bit of production in there. Here are some squash that are overdue. These are yellow scalloped. They're ready to come out. I'll be uh, kind of roasting them in some capacity. If we look in here, you're always looking for, there's a female right there, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven female flowers right there. That's a male flower with the stem beneath it. So this plant is doing really well. I only have one large um, squash plant growing. I thought this was a zucchini. It wasn't. It was yellow scallop, so I wish it was the zucchini. However, because it's just one plant, I can take... Here's some eggs. I can take more time. I'm just going to pinch this leaf off. But you can see the eggs are right here. If you're not growing a ton of plants, it's a lot easier to come and really look at uh, the undersides of the leaves and kind of manage them for pests. There's a squash that fell off that didn't get pollinated, as I was talking about. When you see this pattern, that's usually something feeding on the underside. And there might be, let's just take a quick look. There might be some hatched eggs with some hatchlings feeding on the plant. But the hatchlings are more susceptible to the dust than the actual squash bug. They're really, really hard to take care of. I mean, just look how nice the scallop squash is though. There's one in there. So that's gonna be a, a really productive plant. I did drop in another zucchini plant as a transplant that will take off, that will get big as this. In this space, this is a 4x8, one scallop squash, one zucchini. I have some uh, cherry tomatoes growing in there. They're going to grow up the fence. Sunflowers are doing really, really well. Here is where I had um, the problem with the outbreak of the fungus, and they're doing pretty well. I've got baking soda spray down with some other ingredients. And when you're looking at these leaves, I'm not seeing any of the yellow spotting or the, the brown spotting with the yellow halo. That means it's under control. I don't know if you can see this, but right in here, there's a brown spot. That was fungus that died off. There's no yellow halo around it, which means it's not active. When you come over here, you can see some yellowing, that's something else. But the spots, the brown circles, are, they just don't have that bright yellow halo. That means that you got the fungus under control. These ended up getting three rounds of the hydrogen peroxide, and it seemed to do, you know, really well with uh, controlling it. Tons of tomatoes, they're all gonna be rolling in really quickly. That's a tomato plant that I double pruned or double stem pruned, same with this one. The plants over here I'm letting go. Some of the varieties have yellowing leaves. I'm not really worried about that. That's just how they're reacting to heat. Your tomato plants will vary based on the variety on how they may uh, react to high heat. And I mean we can just take a look in here. So when my sunflower, these are random, you know, you really want to break off this is the time when the humidity comes here in Maryland. I mean, these are leaves that just aren't needed. Get rid of them. I just throw them on the ground. That just lets in more light. Let's get rid of this one. And just helps with the airflow. The sunlight helps manage, I think, pests and disease better. When you've got the sunlight coming in and you have 
air flowing through there better. Onions are ready to be pulled out and dried. They just turned out beautifully. These were the candy variety. People were asking me what variety they were. I had to go look it up. These are my hot peppers. Different varieties. Those are Serranos in there. Got some Anaheims right there. I like to wait till they sort of turn red a little bit. These are early jalapenos. Poblanos, they're taking off. I mean, everything's starting to roll in. These are red cayennes, which are looking not super thin. So these just might be a thicker red cayenne. Tomatillo, I decided to de seed themselves, so I let two grow. They just get attacked by the. Um, of course, I just forgot it, <laughs> the flea beetles. That's what all these holes are. So this crop tends to attract all the flea beetles and then you can dust and get them under control. But even with dusting, I mean, the insects just love, just love putting holes in here, but they produce really, really well. Tomato plants, again, more. I think I have 30 varieties. I went over those, I think, in one of the ramblings. Here's what tomatillos look like. They start out like this. They have a outer husk and inside the tomatillo will form. And when this turns brown, that's when you know it's ready to harvest your tomatillos. They're kind of tart um, in a good way and I really, really like them in salsas. In here, I have my asparagus. So today I took the same shears that I pruned the muscadines with and just went in there and chopped all the edges of the asparagus so that I had airflow in there. And I'll get in here with a weed eater, clean all this out. This is kind of where I stopped. But I wanted that airflow down there. I wanted the sunlight coming in here. And maybe that's what I want to stress a lot today is airflow and sunlight so that your garden doesn't get overshaded and just become this big kind of mess where moisture hangs out and humidity hangs out and disease forms and you know the bad pests show up. But I did that. Um, to the asparagus. The asparagus needs to grow and fern out like this for the whole season, but you can cut a lot back. So this will recharge the root system so I have asparagus next year, but you don't have to let it kind of get out of control. Just trim it down like it's a hedge. Mexican sunflower, there's another pollinator. That's a honeybee actually. I think this is going to be beautiful. This is just going to be covered in these red orange flowers and I like mixing in the flowers for the beneficial insects. These are my super hots. They are actually growing at the speed they're supposed to grow. They just tend to grow more slowly but there's ghost peppers in here. There's some new pepper in here called um, what is it called? <laughs> Let's see. I can't read it upside down. This is the Armageddon. I don't eat them. I give them away. People love them but I like growing them. So in this mess, the beets in here are probably ready. These were not turnips. I'm not going to be able to remember. They'll come rutabagas. They just got devastated by the cabbage worm um, from white flies. I'm not going to grow them. They didn't do anything spectacular. The purple top turnip is what I love. They grow just as well as the rutabagas, maybe better. I don't know if the flavor is much different. I don't think so. Um, so don't grow what's problematic. I've already, coming over this way, harvested and used all the, the purple top turnips that were in there. Um, they're delicious. I'm going to plant in another round. We're going to get to an area where I have shade cloth going. Look at the beets in here. These are great. They're ready to come out. Um, they can stay in there for a while. Some sort of fungal disease always comes to my beets at this time, but I don't worry about it because the beet forms perfectly well. I'll come back and get that kohlrabi tucked in here, one of my favorite white flies I can see. So I'm going to have to clear out this whole area and just kind of get rid of this home for bad insects. Tomatoes are coming up that I don't want to come up. The carrots went to seed. I don't mind the flowers. But lots of beets. I mean, look at those. That's beet success. Here's a beet plant that's going to seed, which I might let do because I've never collected beet seeds before. They look pretty good. Clearing out this whole space. Butternut squash going crazy like it always does. The leeks look wonderful. I'm eating these as I want them. 
And when you pull them out now, they have this nice, they can get a little bit bigger, but you can start eating them at this size. Just peel off the outer skin, and these are absolutely delicious. One of my cucumber plants, this is the first one. It's still, it's not doing what I want. It's kind of struggling. I don't know why. It's got some other issue going on. But it's staying green. It's trying to produce. There's little cucumbers on there. I'm going to let it go until my other cucumber plants start producing. This is a spaghetti squash. You can see they're starting right in there. There's actually two of them, maybe three. Again, female always has the fruit under the flower. Celery's still in there. Sunflowers we're cutting, putting in the house in vases. It looks really, really good. More beets in here. I've been eating the ones out of here. So these are cylindrical beets, and they are cylindrical. Look at that one. Massive. Some of the smaller, these were a second wave, so these beets are still forming. Green beans right over there. You can see three of them. There's a lot more in here. So the green beans are producing, and they're just, pole beans are just super prolific. I mean, just look at all the flowers. Kale plant, I cannot get rid of these white flies. They're actually managed a little bit better. Oh, a lot better actually. You would have just seen tons of white flies. So this is day three of hitting them with hydrogen peroxide um, and spinosad. I'm not sure the hydrogen peroxide does anything, but they actually are getting under control. So I'm going to hit them again with the spinosad spray. There's no flowers on here, so I don't worry about using uh, insect sprays on my kale except you want to make sure you're using a product you don't mind eating, even though I wash these, because they're not going to get onto flowers and harm the um, beneficial insects. Again, if you have sunflowers growing, the kale doesn't mind a little bit of shade, but I just want that airflow going through. So here's the garden from this side. This is the side I usually come in. We have butternut squash forming. I mean, this is a good time of year. There are two right in there. Just saw one forming in here. One right there, two right there, three, four. I mean, butternut squash are great. And they're winter squash in the sense that they're good to store for a while. Acorn squash look good. Got to harvest those. There's three. That was two right there. One right there. And every year I kind of forget I keep thinking that this acorn squash variety is going to climb like this one, and it doesn't. It's more contained. So you just want to keep that in mind. Here's, here's the butternut squash vine. I mean, this probably grew, seriously, like two feet. And you can see where it's connecting to the ground. Probably grew two feet in a couple of days. Where it's connecting to the ground, the roots are coming out. So that's one way to beat the vine borer, is to send a vine along the ground. You can see a little female butternut right there. Root systems will develop and it will pull you know nutrients into the plant in case a vine borer shows up where I originally planted it. So it's a good strategy. So maybe I'll let this just crawl along here and just see what happens with it. Growing vertically is great, but you're taking all the vines off the ground and you're getting rid of that root redundancy. So if you have fine borers that are really problematic, you might want to start maybe your butternut or vining squash like right there. You trellis them up, you let some go over, you build another trellis here, let those vines go up, and then you just have these redundant root systems in place in case the vine borer does, in, does show up. It's going to kill some of the plant, but in the other places where vines have secured themselves to the ground with new roots, they're going to be able to grow and they're going to be okay. I talked about this last time. It is so handy. I wish I would have done this four years ago in the sense that I have all my sprays and stuff right in here. So I just have to walk over here instead of out of the garden. Added in shade cloth. So shade cloth brings a percentage of shade. I think this is like a 50% shade cloth. I don't remember. But it blocks 50% of the sun. So 50% of the sun is going through. If you got a 70% shade cloth, it would provide 70% shade. So only 30% of the sun's going through. Why is that important? So here in Maryland Zone 7, 
about a 40 or 50 percent shade cloth is perfect to cool the ground when we get into those 90 degree days my tomatoes and peppers will shut down I have shade kind of going on in my garden but if you're in really hot areas down south now uh, Arkansas Alabama over across Arizona where it's always hot a 70 percent shade cloth will extend the production period of your peppers and tomatoes because it's going to keep everything 10 to 15 degrees cooler and your plants aren't going to drop flowers or drop fruit. That's what you use shade cloth for. Kale and air is still going super strong. This is a video that I did with Kim when she was down here. And a lot of people said, you can't grow that many peppers in there. Well, you can um, because I've been doing it for over five years. But what you have to do is just make, what you have to do is just make sure you keep water in there so you may have to water every day keep the moisture levels up right in there is basil coming up the best way to grow basil is to drop seed buying transplants from stores is kind of a waste of money a lot of times they just go to flower real quickly and, and try and seed and you don't get much Szechuan type peppers looking good some bush beans in there but this whole area is going to take off lots of water even got some bunching onions so here's a closer example so for the shade cloth I'm going to grow a cucumber plant in there. Towards the end, we'll go out um, to where I have a cucumber plant that seeded itself under a tree. It's doing really well. So I want to see how this cucumber plant, there's two of them in there, does with this shade cloth on here. Have another one sitting outside the shade cloth, obviously. And see how the leaves are starting to kind of droop? Well, the sun just came out not too long ago. So as soon as that heat of the sun starts hitting the plant, it stresses it, it droops, it's trying to survive, it's trying to, you know, regulate the water in there. Right inside, that plant does not have drooping leaves. So, following the cues of nature from that plant itself seeded under a tree that looks great, I'm kind of experimenting. And this is just laying over concrete mesh and it's secured with clothespins so that I can easily take it off. Like anytime you set this up, you want to be able to easily take the cover off. If I wanted to bring in more sun, when the sun gets over here, I could raise it. So I like this kind of space. I think this looks okay. Let me just show you. Here is really, you can get shade cloth in any dimension just about. You know, this one was bigger. So there's a flap. I could pull this down and drop it over. I'm using clothespins just to keep the flap open. But this is what I wanted to show you. So some of them come with uh, grommets, I think they're called. And they're just these metal rings that are in here. Just simple hooks, and you can just put them on there. If you don't have hooks, you can bunch up a corner of the shade cloth, tie it shut, and then you can, or tie it closed, and then you just make a loop with some stronger cord, and you can do the same thing. But I can take this down, put it up real simply, and store it as I need to. There's nothing fancy here. And that's what I did, like right over there. Just keep it simple. But this is going to really reduce the temperature under here. I'm going to put in some more of my purple top turnips, maybe some cool weather crops, and just see how they do now. Coming back through here, sweet potatoes are starting to go crazy. Something's back eating them. I'll take care of that later. I put in another round of bush beans so that I have a continuous supply of the beans going. And again, that's one of the strategies is to keep your crops uh, going through the summer. Keep planting. Here's a good example right here. Let's see if we can just get that in there. All those little brown specks are fungus marks that have died off. Maybe in the shade you can see it better. So when you have the brown specks left and again the halo is gone, you have it sort of under control. So the cherry tomato is doing fine. Nothing to worry about with that. Let's go over here. We'll walk over to the tomatoes over there, then we'll walk out. Cleaning this section up slowly but surely. I just don't need to plant anything else in here. Um, I want to, but I'm letting the potatoes do their thing. They're doing really well. There's a close-up of a I knew I was going to miss it. Here's another one. The Colorado potato beetle, which you just want to smash. So I had the larvae in here. I killed off a bunch of them. They go dig into the ground. Then they come out as adults. And that's what they look like. So now the adult is eating and it's laying eggs again. So I want to go through here, 
find as many as I can and just get rid of them. They have this nice orange yellow goo which is kind of disgusting but you got to smash them. Get rid of them. Coming through here here's some eggplant. I keep forgetting to water this area but these are small eggplants so these are actually ready to be harvested and there's lots of damage in here. A little bit of yellowing throughout the leaf because it needs to be fed and I haven't been watering but it's they're starting to get flea, flea beetle damage but just tons of little tiny eggplant that are ready for stir frying. In here you can see where I put a watermelon there's one growing right there it's doing pretty good in the shade you can see that cucumber we will walk out there in a second that cucumber is growing under my nectarine tree and it's looking pretty good too this is the other side of the globe artichokes let's spin back around here some Japanese beetles nope that was <laughs> just some mulch. Whenever you're weed eating, the mulch flies everywhere, so sometimes I find it in weird places. I wanted to show show this section off. I'm doing a series called Grow Your Food Security, and this is the space I'm using. Everything in here has been planted by seed. So 21 days ago, the zucchini went in. It's to this size. The two Matt's Wild Cherries, I'll be thinning it down to one plant at some point, is now established and it's really going to take off and double and triple in size every five to seven days now that the root system is all set up. Two to three feet wide, eight feet long to where the pole beans are. The pole beans were seeded. Just put in some uh, bush cucumber seeds there. So this is only about 12 feet long, two feet, three feet wide. You have to mound it up, get soil from different places and just any organic granular on sale water soluble is all you need. But I wanted to show people how to really just start, you know, a simple garden. You don't need all this fancy stuff and you don't have to spend a lot of money. These are all planted by seeds. The seeds are going to last a good five years and you can just, you know, reuse them obviously year after year. So a two dollar pack of seeds you're going to get, you know, five years worth of um, plants out of. But it looks pretty good. And you can see right in there when I cleared out this section, those are russet potatoes that I pulled out. They're going to go inside today. One of them has some green growing. I'll replant that somewhere so I get another wave of potatoes. Purple cone flower. I can see just tons of honeybees flying around there. You want to bring in the pollinators. That's horseradish. I just added that out of the clay pot, put it into there. I think that's going to be cool. I'm going to replant this container at some point. I'm working on that. And then, let's go over here. I mean, I have all these tomatoes. They're looking good, really producing. Nine plants in here. And I keep looking for diseases, keeping an eye on things, but they look nice and green. I've got a bean plant self-seeded growing up there. And this is all you really want to do. A couple times a week, several times a week. Now this says Brandywine Red, but they have a weird green pattern. I wonder if I messed up the variety again and that's a green striped tomato plant. But they're looking healthy, you know, they're getting to that four foot mark. Brandywines always get kind of problems on the leaves, but I know that I'm spraying, I know that I'm managing it, and you know, we'll just see how they go. Here's a view of the metal containers, all the different cantaloupes, watermelons that I put in there. I mean, everything is doing what it needs to do. These are bunching onions. These are ready to come up. That celery back there, which I'll be um, using more for like stews and soups because it gets a little bit bitter and a little bit stringy come the heat of the summer. All right, let's go ahead, take a look outside and we'll wrap up, up out there. This had lettuce planted in here around the onions. These onions probably aren't gonna get much bigger, but it was kind of fun to do and those would be perfect kind of grilled up and caramelized. I'll probably eat those with the shishitos in some way. Potatoes are just doing really, really well. Nice and green, doing good in here. Keep them watered, that's the biggest thing, is a lot of people just let their plants suffer. An inch of rain a week is not enough from nature. You really have to keep watering these plants more often than you think. If you keep them watered, instead of just surviving, as I've been saying, you're gonna thrive and you're gonna do a lot better all kinds of peppers, um, potatoes in there. And I just reach into the ground, 
pull them out and I've been eating them for breakfast. Sweet potatoes, looking really, really good. All these beautiful white butterflies that lay the eggs of the green cabbage looper. What can you do? These are all poblanos that I put in. They got a feeding. They're gonna start taking off. Here is the tomato plant that I've been showing you that is almost up to my shoulders, past four feet, seeded itself, has not been sprayed. There are no disease marks on there. There, I don't even really see any. Oh yeah, there are some insect marks on there, some minor chewing and stuff. But overall, this plant is beautiful. I've done nothing. I didn't start this indoors. It's just growing itself. So there's something said for just putting a seed in the ground and not overcomplicating things. And I think that's the theme that I want to take into next year, really. Another cherry tomato that seeded itself. I'm just letting it go up there. I pulled out my onions and garlic that were in this space. You know, there's aren't huge bulbs. These are from onion sets, the little tiny onions that you plant, and they never seem to do well. So they're still tasty. So I'm letting them dry for about a week um, so that I can store them. Garlic is out. These are, I think these are like cow peas. So they're beans technically, but they grow a different way. They actually just sprout out just like this. They're absolutely delicious. And they seem to be more resistant to fungal issues. So if you want to grow cow peas or the related type beans along with your green beans, it's a good practice because you'll get, you're going to find what plants do well with your disease and pests. And the cow peas seem to do pretty well. Now these are outside my fence, so deer do come and chew them down, but these are doing pretty well, you know. They do climb, so uh, look at that, black ants. <sighs> um, crawling all over. So I don't know what the black ants do, maybe they harvest something from them, but they tend to not cause a problem. I have some okra that I just transplanted into here. The globe artichokes are doing really well. This is cocoa core. This is garbage stuff. I don't like it. I bought it for mulching, and I think for me personally, there's always that argument between cocoa core and peat moss, and that's up to you. We each have our own perspective. But it costs so much to ship this over overseas in a boat, strip down forest, grow the coconut trees. I just don't think it's worth it, you know? So this is for mulch. So it's not being used as a peat substitute. It's not grindly, or ground down real finely. But, I mean, why am I buying this? It's just, I'll just use wood chips. It's a lot better for the environment, I think. It's always a trade-off. Artichokes, doing really, really well. Now, I don't tend to eat them because I love the flowers, and the flowers are just beautiful. So I'm just letting them grow and this one will open maybe next Friday. You'll see what a artichoke flower looks like. And here, we'll end here. This is my nectarine tree. And the nectarines are being chewed up by some insect. I'll have to start spraying one day. But I really made it, a, uh, I really had the plan to just let my trees go and recover from the cicada. So this tree looks great. It's gonna get pruned, it'll get sprayed next year. Here's the cucumber plant, maybe two that are just growing on their own. So there's, you know, a female cucumber. Hopefully it got pollinated, but it's a little bit beat up, but it's nice and green. There's a cucumber beetle. Oh, an old one that's dead. But look how good it looks. With a lot of shade, you can see leaves missing over there. That's where deer came in and ate it. But I think, you know, Nature just taught me something that using shade for cucumber plants, even though they're warm weather crops, is going to make a big difference. Thanks so much for watching. Please check out my seed shop at therustedgarden.com. Enjoy your gardens. Don't be afraid to experiment. Try different things. And whatever plants that, that don't do well this year, you know, get rid of them. Don't grow them next year. Find some new plants and stick with what really grows. Again, thanks so much for watching and enjoy your weekend.